Welcome everyone to this OMS uh, Oxford Martin School session on getting to net zero. Steve Smith, our host, is with us. He seems to have frozen right now, so uh, it is a very cold day, so I don't blame him for freezing over. Uh, at least cold day here in Oxford. I'm looking out the window at the snow coming down. Uh, with me is Saganda Srivistov, who is actually uh, in a place which I dare say isn't too cold right now. It's probably hot. Uh, for a number of reasons, uh, both politically and environmentally, but uh, Suganda's in Myanmar, so hopefully we won't have too many connection problems there. Um, but what Steve would have done were he with us, and I'm sure he'll rejoin us in a moment, is to introduce this session as part of a series of talks on um, getting to net zero as part of the new Oxford net zero uh, launch and process across the university. Uh, we're already several talks in. Those of you who are joining us, rejoining us after hearing the earlier talks in the in the series, hopefully we will live up to, I know, what has been a very high quality set of discussions so far. Uh, today, what we'll be focusing on are sensitive intervention points as part of, this is an Oxford Mountain School uh, program on the post-carbon transition that actually was established prior to the, the launch of Oxford Net Zero. And we've been going for a little while now thinking about how we can uh, accelerate progress towards net zero because we know that, you know, increasingly many of these uh, variables are pointing in the right direction. Uh, and the challenge for us is to, is to push them further, push them faster, and to tip uh, some of the remaining uh, sectors and areas and countries over the edge and so they can join the race uh, towards net zero. And Suganda and I will be uh, explaining some of the work that's been going on as part of that program. Uh, you'll see in the in the screen in front of you, you can, you can visit the Oxford Net Zero website, there's a little green button. You can ask us a question, which hopefully when Steve rejoins, he can chair, uh, but otherwise we will just manage directly. And vitally, and um, this is a novel thing for me, having done a number of these Oxford Mountain School uh, webinars or, or sessions, there is a poll just uh, next to the ask a question button. And what we're looking for from you, and we'd love your engagement here, is which of these nine areas um, do you think are most important for accelerating action towards net zero? So where are the sensitive intervention points to be found? Now, you don't have to vote immediately. If you don't want to, you can have a listen to what we're going to say about the areas over the course of the next 25 minutes or so. Uh, but if you have a strong view, then um, you can dive in straight away. So they include deepen public engagement, align action with social justice, reorganizing government um, to, to align government institutions around achieving net zero. It's good to see the votes coming in. People have strong views, obviously. Leverage international connections, increase business ambition, uh, accelerate tech progress, maximize synergies, redirect capital flows, or harness legal avenues. So far, well, actually, it's interesting. And I, in fact, I won't bias things by, by saying anything more. But it's very enjoyable for, for us to watch what's coming in. I don't know whether, whether you can all see that or not. Um, it obviously depends you, whether you're biased or not, depends strongly on whether you can see them. But let, let me get, uh, get going with the presentation. Um, Steve, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, but I hope will rejoin us at some point soon. We're, in all honesty with you, we were expecting the connection problems to be with Myanmar, uh, not with London. But there you go. Uh, there are there are issues with both jurisdictions. Um, although, is that Steve returning? Uh, Hello, I am back now, yeah. Um, can you imagine that my internet connection in London dropped just at the second we were going live? So there you go. It's a lesson that these things are not necessarily always reliable in the UK either. But so I'm glad to see you're, you're carrying on, so. Well, I, I had carried on, but do you want to say something about Net Zero and, and share your welcome before I dive uh, into the talk? Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I will very briefly then. So welcome, everybody. Good to see you. A very warm welcome in particular for those of you who are looking outside the window and seeing snow as I am here in London. Um, so this is the fourth instalment in our series of conversations titled Oxford Net Zero Climate in the Balance. And for those of you uh, for whom this is your first time or you don't know me, I'm Steve Smith. So I'm the executive director of the Oxford Net Zero Initiative. 
Um, and th this week is is one that uh, I think should be a particularly interesting one, as Cameron and Suganda have no doubt mentioned. This is about sensitive intervention points, which is not really so much a source of emissions or a traditional research discipline, but almost a way of viewing the transition as a whole. Um, Cameron doesn't need much introduction at all from me, but is a professor of environmental economics and director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment. Um, and has, uh, you have degrees in law and engineering, is that right, from Melbourne University in Australia, um, and came to Oxford for a master's and then a doctorate in economics. Um, and Suganda uh, is studying for a doctorate with Cameron on environmental economics and has studied economics previously at Warwick and London School of Economics. Um, so I'm delighted um, uh, that we're, we're holding this session and mixing it up a little bit with this poll as well, which Cameron mentioned. Without further ado, I'll hand over to you both and then hopefully we'll have a good amount of time to, to discuss what you and the audience ask us questions as well. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Uh, well done for making it back on. That's, uh, that's a, a relief to all of us. So um, here are some slides which I hope you can see. And I'll just whiz through these. And so again, will join me in talking about some of the intervention points. I should acknowledge and thank uh, input from Penny Mealy, uh, Matt Ives, Doan Farmer, and indeed the whole team for the Post Carbon Transitions uh, project here. So I wanted to share a little bit about thinking around the framing of the idea of a sense of intervention point. Some of you who've been tracking what we've been up to uh, will find this familiar. And then um, start to get a bit more granular. And this is going to be based on a report that we did for the Committee on Climate Change here in the UK, uh, published in December, that uh, collected a panel of some very good thinkers, engaged people, and put together a list of 40 interventions across the nine areas that you're voting on right now. And Suganda and I have picked out some of our favorites, which happen, as it turns out, to be some of your favorites as well. Uh, probably not a coincidence. And we'll talk about them in some more detail before the Q&A. So the framing here is that, um, you know, Getting to net zero involves changing not just one system, but multiple systems and indeed a system of systems. And when you've got these um, complex systems as they are, complex adaptive systems, things don't always quite go according to plan. They're not linear and they're not even as simple, not remotely in fact, as simple as the ball in a, in a trough that we're showing you on the right picture there. But that little analogy is gonna help us to think about Way the ways in which we can perturb these systems. So uh, what we're looking for here are ways of intervening in these systems, whether it's a food system or the energy system or the transport system or you know, different subcomponents of industry or so on. Uh, how can we intervene in ways that can push the ball up uh, over the little hill there, number two, and then get it rolling downhill uh, point three, where it has its own momentum. So we're, we're wanting modest inputs for a, a large and hopefully irreversible change. Now, of course, you know, you don't always have these moments where you can get modest inputs for a large output. Sometimes you just have to put in a lot of effort and put in big input for big output. But, but if there are areas where relatively modest input can accelerate progress towards net zero, we should obviously should be doing them, um, you know, assuming they're not harming us in other ways. So that's the kick, the idea of finding a, a part of the system which is close to a critical point, mathematically speaking, where you can just move the system over, the, over that uh, turning point or tipping point to use Malcolm Gladwell's uh, language and then watch the ball roll down here, hill. And arguably, as we'll discuss, again, we'll discuss on the tech side, uh, we are close or at or in some, in some countries past that point on clean technologies now where they're cheaper than fossil technologies after decades of, of effort. Um, and so they're going to have their own momentum very soon or, or indeed they already do. Well, you just simply wouldn't install a coal plant or a, or a gas plant or you wouldn't buy an internal combustion vehicle engine because they're more expensive and not as good. Now, the other sort of um, sense of intervention point when you're thinking about systems is looking for ways in which you can actually shift the underlying fundamental dynamics of the system, the way components interact with one another or the rules governing the behavior of, of elements of the system. So this is less about moving the ball and more about actually moving the landscape. 
And we highlight here as a shift the, the legislating of the UK's Climate Change Act in 2008, which created um, the Committee on Climate Change, now called the Climate Change Committee, uh, and other institutions that help to make other changes across these systems more uh, feasible uh, and uh, and then they accelerate progress towards net zero. So uh, this is my favorite um, slide to uh, fail to dwell on or to explain, but uh, this work comes out of in particular Doan Farmer's Complexity Economics team, which there are a good dozen or two clever mathematicians and physicists working in there that um, that are applying that kind of thinking uh, to to the challenges with us jointly in, in economics of sustainability to getting to net zero but of course this this kind of thinking cuts across all complex adaptive systems and the the core insights i suppose are there are often multiple attractors or or in economics language equilibria um, they're not really equilibrium because all systems constantly moving around. Uh, and when you have um, systems that exhibit chaotic behavior, modest moves to a system uh, can deliver big changes in the final state. So you're very sensitive to in initial conditions and sensitive to perturbations. The other feature that's relevant here is that we're looking for interventions that are going to have some kind of inherent positive feedback to them. If, if you want a small kick, or small shift to deliver a large outcome, then there has to be some amplification process that you can observe uh, ha happening. Now, sometimes that amplification process can be just that you know you've shifted the view of the or, or, or indeed the identity of say the president of a country uh, that um, could have can have and is in already having in the U.S. very big impacts on how systems change. Uh, but but equally, it could be a Swedish teenager, uh, not of herself, uh, a huge global, um, you know, persona until, of course, she now is because of the way these social dynamics have amplified the phenomenon of Greta Thunberg. And, and now we are where we are. We've seen these sorts of changes happen in physical landscapes. We know that uh, the climate system is itself a complex system. And we know that social systems are complex as well, indeed, in some cases, more complex because the kind of particles that are moving around are humans with their own thoughts and ideas, and they can shift systems as well. Here, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, a couple of uh, sledgehammers, and leading to the downfall of an economic system. So we took this thinking, and with the Committee on Climate Change and a, and a, a great panel or advisory board, uh, applied it for the last um, six carbon budget report. And this is one of the figures in that report uh, produced by the one of the ABLE members of the Committee on Climate Change. Thank you, Jake. Um, that shows how you can get multiple interactions between different dimensions here. You know, beliefs have a habit of becoming self-fulfilling in economic and financial systems. So those narratives can shift uh, they relate to beliefs. Education can change beliefs over a medium to long term period. Um, leadership matters in these instances, too. You don't often see that appearing within core economic theory. But actually, one individual at the top of an organization can shift the organization, whether political or, or commercial. And technology matters. Um, and, uh, you know, behaviors themselves. We're very social animals. We tend to copy one another for good or ill. So there, there are many factors, you know, many of which I haven't discussed, shown there um, that can combine to deliver the sorts of outcomes that we want. So that's a kind of a, a quick overview of the framing. Uh, and then what we wanted to do with you now is just take you through some of the the 40 sensitive intervention points in the nine categories that comprise the report for the Committee on Climate Change. And, and perhaps if somebody else doesn't do this, I will post a link to it in the chat, those who are interested in it. But we categorize them uh, along the lines of the nine there in, in the voting box. So uh, there are interventions that can deepen public engagement with this issue. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, there are ways in which you can design the transition to net zero to make it more or less just and fair and to level up society so that people feel like this is something they want. Whether they care about the climate or not, they would like 
a good job and meaningful work and you know not to be poor and etc so uh, and this is true globally as well as in the uk um, there's often in many countries the need to reorganize the way government works here you know climate kind of moves so far up the agenda till other issues dominate and it gets pushed back down again we're, we're actually not going to get to net zero if that continues to happen so in many countries um, shifts in the way you know not major shifts but shifts in how we prioritize climate change and net zero are going to be required Obviously, as an economist, you wouldn't be surprised to hear me say that we should uh, get the, the incentives right, get the prices right. And and in a, a high economy-wide carbon price is, of course, the nirvana. It's what we would always want to see as economists, hard to get. Um, in the absence of getting an economy-wide carbon price, other interventions like um, the take-back obligation, which would force fossil emitters to sequester a certain fraction of the carbon that they extract. There are international dynamics. I'll say a bit more about them. We could uh, deal with the the business community very in a very detailed way, almost managerial way, because there are very few businesses actually responsible for the large proportion of emissions. You manage those businesses effectively, and we could um, reduce emissions significantly. And tech is obviously important. Capital is important. We'll say a bit more about them, as is the law. And I, I guess the conclusion from this Committee on Climate Change report is that if we get this right, both in the UK and globally, then we will have laid down the infrastructure by 2050 that we need in many of these sectors, food, energy, transport, et cetera, industry, that will, that once the CapEx has spent the operational costs of running a lot of this clean infrastructure is a lot, lot lower than it is in the fossil system. And so you could well imagine in the next century, they look back at this generation as a bit like the Victorians, laying down the infrastructure on which generations hence will be hopefully grateful, certainly be using this infrastructure. Now, before diving into the SIPs, I just wanted to start with deep and public engagement. I see that it had a lot of votes there. This is really important because while net zero, um, you know, it is a thing, as mentioned in, in the UK's major party manifesto, even in a country that's been pretty well up to speed on this issue here, um, surveys, uh, the, there's a more recent survey than this, but, but as of September 2020, 53% had heard nothing or hardly anything about net zero in the UK. So while you know political economists will say politicians probably have a kind of latent consent to take action here, the risk is that unless the public, unless we all understand what we need to do and why we need to do it and how it's inspiring and how you know if we don't do it we're in trouble, you're not going to have the sustained public support for action that we're going to need over the next uh, couple of decades. So this is a very important intervention. It's not very costly actually. It's just doing it cleverly and in the right way. So that's kind of an uber sip in some sense. Um, now to pick out the four that we wanted to share with you, uh, I'm going to kick off with global dynamics and then hopefully Saganda will come in on tech progress. Um, so on the global side of things, uh, we thought the, the panel led in this instance by Baroness Bryony Worthington thought that bolder UK targets could actually trigger stronger action internationally because if you can um, both commit to getting to net zero in your own country and also help to pay other countries through international offsetting um, so that you get to net zero earlier than 2050 which is probably where we ought to be frankly from a science and ethical position then we can both meet our own obligations and to help other countries get there faster too now, the flip side to that kind of carrot would be a stick, that if you're not taking action on climate change, then we will put into play border carbon adjustments, which, of course, the EU has on the table right now. And there are a few other thoughts there. I'm going to move along just because of um, time. Now, I'm hoping that Suganda can both see this slide and can come in. So I'll, I'll leave what might be an uncomfortable pause here to see. Great, great. Well, um, um, everyone can hear me well. Um, so, so I think it's important to remember how when we paint a vision for a massive green economic transition, alternatives need to be feasible and affordable. Um, so part of this green economic transition is to also 
demonstrate that these alternatives can be scaled up. And what we see is that sensitive intervention points uh, for green technology can be quite powerful because of learning by doing and cost reductions. So it's just this idea that if you put R&D support for green technologies, if you uh, put more finance um, for these technologies and provide credit, then you see that there's this dynamic where uh, more production leads to falling costs, and falling costs themselves lead to greater uptake. This has happened for the solar industry. Uh, we're also seeing it happen for batteries, where year on year there's cost declines. And the really powerful dynamic here is that Many green industries are very interconnected. So when the cost of batteries decreases, we see that there's more uptake of solar panel uh, to balance their intermittency. At the same time, the co the batteries decrease the helps things helps with the uptake of electric vehicles that rely on the batteries. So there's a lot of synergies between the technologies. It's also important to remember to remember there are a couple of couple of markets that's credit constraints, information asymmetries, and perfect appropriability but warrant government intervention to support these green these technologies. Uh, when uh, once this one government intervention event in place, you can see many positive feedback feedback feedbacks, including economy of scale. scale. Um, um, to give an example from history, this very much happened for the case of the case lanes, where the government backed the industry, and once supply chains were set up, uh, we saw declines in air, air, uh, airplane, man airplane manufacturing. Uh, the graph, uh, the graph, right, maybe you can see it, also shows how shows how a fast decline in the coin in the renewable energy battery batteries. Here in the UK, we've seen hey, we've seen the same uh, contract the differences supporting cost declines in um, offshore wind. So uh, I think this is a this is a very cool sip, uh, not least because it shows us what these alternatives are and makes alternatives alternatable at scale. Scale. I'm going to hand back to Cameron now. Now. Thanks again. Uh, um, you did a, a great job in there from the other side of the world. We had a little bit of audio feedback. I especially love the feedback that happened as you said the word feedback. Um, so uh, yeah, for those of you in the chat function, yeah, we, we, we are all on mute other than Suganda when she was speaking. It's just uh, beaming in from a country where there's a coup taking place and where there's interference with the communications was always going to be a bit edgy. But, you know, when we're open to doing edgy things here. So, so that was tech progress. Um, now, as I see it, the one that's currently most strongly upvoted in the chat uh, is redirecting capital flows. And there are some good ones here. Um, for instance, at the moment, companies, especially fossil fuel companies, uh, but you know, all companies get to draw up their accounts based on uh, expectations around the value of their assets in the future. And provided there's some kind of broadly plausible defense for the prices of those assets, then you know off they go. And sometimes they don't even have to disclose them. So for instance, if you're a uh, an international oil company, how you value a barrel of oil has a rather strong effect on your balance sheet. And uh, and if the if the price of oil falls dramatically, then you might have to write off assets on your balance sheet, which then has a, um, an effect on your uh, on your mix of well various financial ratios. In fact, that uh, make your company look more or less attractive. Now, if we are running the global economy in a manner consistent with getting to net zero on a Paris sort of timetable, then, for instance, assuming uh, the oil price is going to stay at $80 for the next 20 or 30 years is probably not really a defensible assumption. It's not really, certainly not a Paris aligned assumption. And one modest intervention that could shift the way capital flows would be to say, you've got to present a set of accounts that values this business and its assets as if the world is actually going to get to net zero. Because you know what? We might. Uh, hopefully, we will. And if we do, then it's false for you to be artificially inflating the value of your assets when, in fact, many of them might be worth zero. So before investors pump more money into this sort of company or strategy or, or set of uh, collection of assets, we, we might want to value them accordingly. So that, that's an intervention that um, uh, Saracen and Partners, uh, the IIGCC, and some of the auditors 
among many others, have been thinking about and, and in fact, bringing into, into existence. Um, so that, that's one way of redirecting capital flows. It's not the only one. We've seen uh, in the last year significant voluntary shifts in flows of capital towards ESG sort of uh, investments, environmental, so uh, social and governance governance related themes. Uh, this is partly because investors are uh, feeling that it's the right thing to do. I think it's partly because they feel like it's what's going to be profitable to do as governments start to change the rules. You will see clean assets start to be higher, more, more strongly valued. Dirty assets will start to have impairments hit them. And so if you're a forward looking investor, you, you want to be on the right side of history on this one, if only for your own pocket. And there's certain bandwagon effects going on over here. Now, there are other financial interventions. There's an associated report uh, with the Committee on Climate Change uh, six Carbon Budget that looks at the various ways in which we could reorient the fan financial system in accordance with sustainability. Uh, I, we highlight one here, uh, which is to create a national investment bank with a green mandate. So for some countries, this will be the creation of such a bank. In the UK, we've actually had one. Uh, it was sold. And I think, and others also think, there is a case for uh, recreating the green investment bank here or, or, or a national infrastructure or investment bank, because some of this investment is best done at a lower cost of capital uh, through, through the state rather than through the private sector. Now, there are many things you don't want the public sector to be doing. You want the private sector to do. But um, you know, it's, it's worth being sharp about your understanding of the economic borders of the state, to use the language of um, my colleague Dieter Helm. So that's redirecting capital flows. Um, now, I don't know if we want to have another attempt at Suganda and see how your, how your feedback is going. But let's see, see if we can give it a crack at harnessing the law. Would you like to come in again? <laughs> sure. And Cameron, just come in if it's too unclear at any point. Okay. Um, so sorry about that, people. But um, the as you know, the military is uh, regulating the internet here, and our bandwidth has been massively cut down. So that explains the uh, uh, But um, for the final sip, uh, this is some. Uh, this is a really interesting, sensitive intervention point because, as an economist, it was one I initially didn't think about. But I ended up writing a paper with a political scientist on it because it was very compelling. Um, to actually use the law uh, in, or, uh, in order to change supply side climate policy. policy. One example that, uh, that Ryan Rafferty and I have written a paper on is that when we looked at the history of fossil fuel permitting law, whether it's coal permitting, permitting or oil pipeline laws, they were written in an era of either there was very little understanding of environmental impacts. Uh, the notion of ocean change wasn't there. And in fact, the very interesting historical context is that uh, many of these permitting laws were uh, written at the time of time world wars, where there was um, a military incentive to excavate these energy resources very quickly and cheaply without much hassle. So that means that actually in many cases, um, the safeguards that you would ordinarily expect for infrastructure permitting laws are simply not present. And at the same time, we can harness uh, some of the other principles in the law, such as, such as um, public benefit, damages, tort law, uh, to, to challenge new fossil fuel permits. So uh, we did a, a case study on uh, the Hambach forest in Germany. Some of you might know that I know been a region where there's been a lot of, been a lot of between activists, activists um, and the lignite, lignite, because the lignite lobby wants to move what's uh, left of a 12,000 year old forest to dig up more lignite. And we saw that if you do a full natural capital accounts assessment, uh, it is very clear that the air pollution damages from, from uh, excavating that lignite and burning it far outweigh any of the benefits of having that energy that end source. Um, um, I think that that's the sort of evidence that you can take to court, to court story evidence-based uh, case uh, for uh, revoking these fossil fuel permits. Uh, that's one example. The other example that uh, people on the net zero team are also working on 
is can you sue you sue for their historical historical lie of climate change? So some of you might be aware of the Exxon News on New where uh, it was revealed that Felix had, uh, had a very clear understanding of the impacts of climate change, uh, but uh, chose to uh, you know publicly so doubt and hide this information. Now there's, a, there's an interesting legal question there that can you actually if they did have this understanding. Uh, uh, battled with their historical emissions and the and the uh, damages images these are causing enough to make of to miss. Now here's where climate scientists come in and say, well, you need to show that there's a causal link between those emissions and the damages that are occurring. And that's where there is a very interesting thing project in the next Euro team that shows that shows that can in fact establish establish the links uh, Rupert Rupert Smith Miles Allen are working on working on and they've um, uh, on how you can link emissions to enhance glacial melt uh, to make that case. Uh, the final case of using the law is against the gas. The so in the Netherlands, we saw, saw that uh, uh, Dutch citizens went in and they sued their own government for lack of climate ambition. They said that the government's targets are not at all consistent and uh, being being a country that is party to the climate to the, uh, accord, the Paris climate climate, uh, and they won they won that case. So I think this I think very promising uh, avenue. It does de does depend on systems where there are unbiased courts. Uh, but if that is in place, we are seeing that the number of cases are on the rise, and some of them are achieving notable successes. And we only need one such case to demonstrate proof of concept and galvanize uh, other case their case. Um, and once once we do have a do have a case, it's case pretty no pretty no uh, to highlight that, highlight that uh, that can set a precedent uh, that could be very useful useful word. Super, thanks, Uganda. And I think we got most of the gist of that, despite the various audio feedback. So thank you, and thanks everybody tuning in for your patience there with the connection. So look, that's um, that's really it from us now. We're wanting to go into some engaged Q and A. I see some very good questions already, uh, which Steve will chair in the in the list there. But I, the, the takeaways are getting to net zero by 2050 globally is going to be a huge undertaking and it's going to require transformation across multiple systems. And, and uh, there are good comments in the chat about some of the missing elements that we haven't listed in those nine. So do, do I'm very keen to have a discussion about them too because you know, there's, there's no sense in which this is uh, exhaustive. Um, what we do know is that getting there, getting to net zero, the benefits, the clarity of the vision, the opportunities are, are becoming clearer and more powerful all the time. There's a positive story, but, uh, you know, it's not easy. There's a question about the coal mine in Cumbria. It just shows that there are these trade-offs and, and blockages and areas that we have to manage on, on the path to net zero. And a lot of this is about implementation, delivery, action, and so on. And so the, the core message is what we're going to need, in addition to these big lifts in some areas, is having this almost venture capital sort of portfolio of interventions is the right thing to do in a complex, dynamic system. We're not going to know which of the interventions is necessarily going to deliver big change. Some of them might fail, but, uh, but having such a portfolio is sensible. And in retrospect, let me leave you with the the rather hopeful thought, and I think not implausible thought, that once we're in 2050 and we've got there, we might look back and say, well, it's all very inevitable, wasn't it? I mean, you know, it seemed hard in the in 2020, 2021, perhaps, but actually it wasn't that difficult. difficult. We just needed to find those pressure points, those intervention points, and uh, that got us over the line. So um, thanks very much and looking forward to this discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Cameron and Suganda, for a really wide ranging uh, journey through all the different elements of the transition really there, or very many of them. And you've been looking at the um, the polling, both of you, no doubt, as you've been uh, talking. And uh, do ask your questions as audience members via Crowdcast as well. We'll come to them in a minute, but I just wanted to take stock of the polling results. I don't know about you, it looks to me like people broadly agree with you. They have the same favorites as you. Um, perhaps there's a bit more on sort of public engagement than than you touched on. So I wondered whether um, each of you, in turn, maybe starting with Suganda, would like to just reflect on those results and and you know pick up any things that pop out to you, get, dive into a bit more detail on ones which look popular, and maybe answer the question: 
does this mean that these are the most important intervention points, the ones you talked about? Are they the real priorities uh, or, or is it a bit more subtle than that? So Suganda, do you wanna tackle that first? Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, so I do notice that accelerating technological progress has got 12% of the votes. And I think it's important, another thing to reflect here is that demonstration is a really important effect for entrepreneurs. So the mere fact of having government support a project and demonstrate its feasibility, so for example, green hydrogen or zero carbon aviation, short distance electric planes, I think that proof of concept if it happens once, can galvanize a whole bunch of other risk, of, you know, uh, entrepreneurs to take that risk. Uh, I think the first breakthrough is really important, and governments have a role to play in stepping in to support that uh, to support the private sector. And this ties in with what Cameron was saying about a green investment bank. Um, but just to say that after the first proof of concept. Uh, you do see a bandwagon effect with other entrepreneurs also coming on board. So I think that that's a really important one. And uh, hopefully what I said helped because one more person just voted for <laughs> technological progress. Cameron, um, what, what, what do you think on, on, on this public perception point? Is there any more you want to say? And, and um, is, yeah. is it possible to rank these uh, sensitive intervention points as well? Or is it is it is that just not something we do? And this is more a kind of list of things for people to consider. Classic Oxford response, Steve, uh, you know, challenge the question. Uh, and, in, and in fact, you're right, actually. Uh, you, I mean, you can't really uh, rank these in some sense in that if, if you have a portfolio, you, by definition, you're saying you don't really really know you're, you're, you're hedging in some sense but you know you can have a punt uh, which is which is going to have the greatest effect um, the other sense in which it's a slightly dodgy question is of course these things are um, multiplicative you know what some of these interventions don't work unless you've had other interventions that are successful so if you have to do a and b to cause c was it a or was it b that caused c and the answer is it was both of them so anyway uh, on the public perception side of things um, Look, I think this really is very important. Uh, I'm not surprised that we've got nearly 20% of the votes for deepening public engagement. Uh, and actually points in the in the question, the Q&A, you know, where's the politics here? I mean, it's a great, it's a great challenge. Uh, and a partial answer, but not a complete one, is that it, it's in the public and the engagement of the publics. Because unless you've got particular electorates and communities buying in to these changes, you're going to have political problems, uh, and you know a good politician is going to be responsive to to their voters. Okay, they're responsive to a bunch of other things too, not least how they're funded, but um, but they do need to be responsive to their voters. So how do we manage? How do we well manage? Is not the right word. How do we properly inform the public um, and bring them up to speed on these on on the options available, so that we can get better collective decision making. Well, we've seen some models already trialed out in the form of the climate assemblies, uh, and there's certainly been some progress there and some good results there. I mean, they're not the be all and end all. There are other ways of doing these things too. But I think what I would say is that, again, th th these are not very costly interventions. You're not talking about hundreds of millions of quid or, or even actually in some of the cases, not even millions of pounds that can change the way people think understand the problem think about the problem and hence their willingness to say yeah, i want to be part of the solution here thanks great and i'm going to turn to the questions now and, and i might as well start with the one which has been uh which has received the highest number of votes and it's about aviation you touched on this Suganda, actually so stuart clark asks how do we deal with the thorny issue of aviation specifically long-haul aviation and of course we know that um, that's been flagged as a very difficult to, to fully abate uh, sector of, of human and economic activity. The, the power density you get from aviation kerosene is just very hard to replace with a battery or something else. Um, so, Suganda, you, you mentioned that clearly uh, tech innovation is important. Are there other areas of leverage when it comes to aviation, aviation or is it purely a tech story? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a really important question. And I think also touching on the politics here is that, um, sure, innovation is an important part of the story. I think uh, green hydrogen offers a promising alternative. Um, but, uh, you know, in the in the interim, we also have to think about behavioral change. Um, and COVID has shown that uh, there are ways to convene conferences and not have have those sort of very hectic lifestyles. But I'll add another thing to the mix here. I mean, there's also the politics of it. I mean, aviation is a strong lobbying group um, and they've had a lot of power in shaping the politics around it and the policies. So dealing with this lobbying group effectively is a very important question. Now, I think over here with um, a lot of people at the Smiths School have talked about green stimulus. We're in a time where we are injecting massive amounts of capital into the economy as a part of the green recovery. Now, for very carbon intensive sectors like aviation, can we tie this stimulus to strings and say that actually part of this, part of the terms and conditions is that you as a company invest more in green hydrogen and technological solutions? So moving these giant lobby groups is uh, an important political facet of the solution. Um, and I do think that in the interim, it's not an either or question. We do have to make progress on the technology. But while we're waiting for that, there has to be some conscious behavioral change at the same time. Uh, um, so I think that it's a combination of strategies. Um, and just to say that this ties into the capital flows point uh, where there are some big movers and shakers out there who control a lot of capital. Look at your uh, hedge funds, your top banks. And uh, if we change the hearts and minds of CEOs, uh, we can actually redirect large sums of capital. Uh, can we ensure that whenever a loan is given out, there's some green condition tied to it? Uh, can we make sure all of our loans and investments are Paris consistent? So I think that's also a really important part. Um, and that if you know, if for a company to be on the stock exchange, we put a condition saying that they have to be Paris consistent, they have to demonstrate that they're engaging in green innovation thoughtfully, that can be very powerful. And there, there you're combining politics with capital flows. Uh, some would say that the two can never be disconnected anyway. So Cameron, the other question that's, that's come up near the top from Miles is about the Cumbrian coal mine. Um, for those listeners uh, who may not be uh, up to speed with this news story in the UK, uh, the UK, uh, despite touting itself as a climate leader and, of course, playing host to the international negotiations this year, has uh, recently given the go ahead to a new development of a new coal mine up in the northwest in Cumbria. Um, the interesting thing about it, or one of the interesting things, is that the, the coal is not specifically for power generation, for which we know there's a very exciting story of technological alternatives that we just discussed. It's actually for coking coal in steel, which is a slightly more specific and, and more tricky issue. There are fewer sort of cheap alternatives in the steel industry for use of coking coal. Um, Miles asks, can we change the narrative between sort of short term jobs now versus securing our long-term environmental future. And I know, Cameron, one of the nice sort of catchphrases you've been using in your report to the CCC is the idea that when we build this stuff, we can become the Victorians of the 21st century. As you mentioned, we, we put the effort into building this stuff now, we reap the benefits in the future. So what does becoming the Victorians of the 21st century look like for West Cumbria and for miners right now? It's a great question, Miles and Steve. Um, I think the, uh, so fairly obviously, what we can't be doing is committing long lived capital to in emissions intensive industries at this stage of the game. You know, it's too late, the game's up, you don't sink that much money into a sector that's going to be emitting from here on. So what do you do? Well, I mean, in steel, there are currently, you know, a couple of alternatives. I mean, either you engage with some of the new process methods that uh, use hydrogen and electricity, much more expensive, admittedly, but, you know, there are a couple of demonstration plants up and running, some countries moving at this with speed. Um, the Swedes are ones that get touted all the time, but they're not the only ones. Uh, and, you know, is this not an opportunity in the year of COP26 for the UK government to perhaps think that we could take a position in green steelmaking? So that's one, one approach. 
The other approach would be to say, as Miles himself is championing, and I've got no doubt that he wanted to stick a hook in the in the Oxford Canal for me to swim up to and bite on. So let me do that for you, Miles. But uh, that the that the emissions associated with the coking coal uh, should be completely neutralised by virtue of a, a carbon take back obligation or sequestration obligation, where you, know, you, you as a as a licensing condition for the establishment of the uh, of a plant that is going to involve future emissions, you you have to find different technological advances to capture CO2 from the air and then stick it back underground or remineralize it and in some way sequester it permanently. So I think that's another uh, solution here. Steve, you asked, what does what does the Victorians of the 21st century look like for Cumbria? And that's the right question. It goes also to the question about politics here. The, the reason the Cumbrian mine is so popular in Cumbria, which it is, by the way, it's, it's, it's not as if they're kind of protesting against it, people want it. There's a sense of pride in the mining community in that part of the world. There's a sense that, well, you know, honestly, that it's not um, a jobs rich space at the moment. So anything that can revitalize and create jobs is very welcome. Uh, and these are things that shouldn't be brushed aside. You, we, we, If you're interested in getting to net zero, as we all, humanity needs to be, then we need to find ways in which we can also create a sense of Britain being remade or the world's economy being remade in ways that are fairer and give people meaningful jobs and so on. So what does that look like in Cumbria? Well, I mean, if we were to go with electric arc and or hydrogen based steelmaking, make it a real center for excellence and so on, then, um, you know, that would help the country as a whole. Would it help Cumbria? I mean, possibly not because the coal just because you're mining the met coal, the coking coal in one place, doesn't mean that that's where you're making the steel. So you know, these things are very, very complex. It's perhaps that the answer for a, a, a clean, green, mean, prosperous Cumbria, or maybe not mean, but prosperous Cumbria lies outside of the uh, of the um, mining, well, coal mining at least industry. It may lie in other areas of minerals extraction or, or in other industries altogether. So uh, th actually looking to Penny Mealy's work, also part of the post carbon transition team and others working with her, uh, Alex Tietelboim and so on, on the green adjacent possible sector um, sort of work is, is a key way of making progress here. Sigander, I wondered if you wanted to pick up that point, actually, which was asked by Neil in the questions about the role of politics. Uh, he was struck that politics isn't a word which appears in these nine categories of SIP. Uh, is that a lens through which you view all of these or is it a, a different SIP which has been ignored? Um, I, I know that actually in the original article in the journal Science, which sort of set this out, that the, the UK Climate Change Act, so a specific piece of legislation was given as an example, but how, how do you see politics fitting into this, Uganda? Sure, happy to come in on that. Um, so I think this, the politics is essential because uh, there's no point designing the optimal policy if uh, we can't actually pass it through uh, legislatures. Um, just checking if everyone can still hear me. Um, yeah, okay, great. So I think Cameron, so, so we're, we also have additional work thinking about how we can make climate policy uh, amenable for everyone. Um, and I think part of this, a big part of it is clever strategies. So we have a set of five strategies to make climate policy more politically amenable. Um, a big part of that is appeasement, where you provide compensation to communities that will lose out from the transition uh, that have been downtrodden or deindustrialized areas. I think as Cameron already mentioned, there needs to be a large scale economic revival in these areas where we need to uh, very tactfully think about the new job creation opportunities that can be there. And I think a key uh, toolkit here is having green transition funds that are distributed to regions that do not um, have obvious uh, opportunities in front of them and belong to those deindustrialized areas. Um, that's important. I think uh, the other facet of this is 
to, as we already said, we need to co-opt some of the biggest carbon intensive majors so that they can change their business model. Um, some of them have uh, massive amounts of capital at their disposal. And, you know, there needs to be a conversation about how that capital can be real reallocated, uh, what will be needed to actually invest in green innovation sustainably. Um, and, and that will be an important part of engaging these lobby groups. Uh, there are there are more strategies here. I mean, public awareness falls into that area of raising uh, climate consciousness. Uh, some of the tactics can be antagonistic. You know, there's been a, a, in, a Extinction Rebellion and so on. Uh, but I think that they raise the voices of those who care about climate change and bring it to the table. Uh, and we can agree that these movements have played a massive role in getting climate change the coverage it deserves and bringing it to the forefront of media attention. Um, I. I see that there's, you know, what we haven't talked about is developing countries. Uh, there's a comment on Latin America and how investment can be galvanized in developing countries. Um, I think that there needs to be a mix of uh, good politics there, uh, international negotiation, but also a real understanding of the challenges. I mean, in many cases, it's as simple as uh, currency fluctuations stop uh investment coming into these countries so can we put in place currency hedging instruments can there be local green investment banks so i think uh those are some thoughts on that issue but happy to come in more later actually yeah i'd like to i was thinking of coming back to you on that suganda uh, it's a great question from ricardo pereira about the the role of developing countries uh, he asked specifically about investment but i wondered whether you wanted to just expand a bit does, does this language of SIPs, in a sense, uh, reinforce and entrench a kind of power dynamic system where SIPs and the people who have agencies are, are those who uh, are the, you know, the traditional power brokers in, in geopolitics? Or does this have application and are there particular uses in, in different contexts in developing countries and other parts of the world? Do you, do you want to unpack that a bit more, mm -hmm. Suganda, and maybe, maybe Cameron afterwards? Yeah, sure. Very happy to. Um, you know, I can give this, I, I can talk about some examples here, but um, I think there is often a notion in uh, at least some developing countries that the green transition is very costly. Um, and this is something that I think in a lot of developing in countries, we've seen solar tenders and solar auctions at record low prices. I mean, we've seen solar auctions in Rajasthan with very low prices. We've seen the same happen um, in Myanmar, for example, where I'm currently based. And actually having that sort of uh, demonstration that you can hold a solar tender and it can come in at prices that are much lower than your conventional hydrocarbon assets is a big proof of concept and can be a technological and political sip in its own right because it challenges those narratives that have persisted in international climate negotiation arenas that uh, the green transition is very expensive. At the same time, though, um, I think there's growing awareness that, um, you know, richer countries have to pull their weight. I think, uh, Steve, you're right that there's been a bias in our talk that a lot of the interventions we've suggested are very focused on uh, OECD countries. But I think there's a lot that we can also do around uh, nature-based solutions uh, that can have a big impact in developing countries. We haven't talked at all about um, small interventions that can have a huge impact, like mangrove reforestation in, um, in Bangladesh or in Myanmar, in these areas where there's a very vulnerable coast. I mean, not only will that sort of absorb carbon dioxide and be a very valuable carbon sink, but it will also provide adaptation against climate change impacts. And I think identifying the nexus of interventions that offer developing countries not only mitigation, but also adaptation benefits is a really compelling idea. Um, so I think that the SIPs for developing countries will have to be adjusted to have that focus. And I think nature-based solutions is one where at quite a small cost, you can often get a multitude of different benefits. 
And I, I see uh, that Adrian, you, you nicely touched on a question from Adrian Lovett about he was looking for regenerative agriculture as the thing he was looking for. And uh, so you say that's clearly important in, in, in various parts of the world. It's also important uh, here um, because we are leaving the European Union in case anyone didn't notice or we have left and uh, changing our whole system of land management from a po policy point of view. Um, so you're quite right that that's a very sensitive intervention point right now. Um, Cameron, did you want to add anything to to that point about uh, the role of SIPs or the or, or, or the the role more generally of uh, in, in developing countries in 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 this story? You know, clearly we can't get there with uh, just the UK or just the European Union or just the West, uh, and this is a global challenge, in, including all nations, including developing countries. There's also a question about uh, China on the list too. Um, and so, actually, I might sweep up a few questions quickly if I can. What, what one is, you know, is the best marginal pound spent here, or should we spend it abroad? Uh, and I think, you know, that. In a sense, we're not that interested in the marginal pound. Goodness, shock horror! Economist says the margin isn't that important. But this is this is transformational change here. We all have to get to zero. So we've got to get to zero here, just as we've got to get to zero everywhere. And if we can get ourselves to zero faster and in a compelling way that shows um, how it can be done, I mean, this this is the argument for leadership. I know probably many of you listening in will find that compelling. Others will find it complete rubbish. Uh, but, you know, the UK has offered some successful leadership on this dimension. It's one of the, perhaps the few dimensions in which we're offering the world really compelling leadership right now. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's, that's worth investing in getting it sorted domestically. But equally, there are some very sensible things that we can and should be doing jointly with other countries in their countries right now. So, so I don't think it's either or. It's thinking again systemically about um, how we can trigger uh, rapid change, and then on the developing, specifically in developing countries, um, you know, an awful lot of this challenge is actually about how we manage land, which which was picked up in the regenerative agriculture point. Not just because we need to be, um, you know, changing the way in which we uh, consume food so that we're not eating so much. Uh, you know, animal products that that drive deforestation, that you know, put greenhouse gases in the wrong direction, sending greenhouse gases up into the atmosphere rather than sequestering them. But equally, land is a huge potential sink for uh, greenhouse gases and a, and a source of sequestration. Which, you know, again, many of you listening may not think, well, we we don't want to be doing that. We want to be stopping our emissions. But actually, if we're going to get to net zero, we're going to have to do both as fast as possible. So this is in no way a call to slow down mitigation efforts that have to go full speed ahead. But we also need to be thinking about sequestration efforts at the same time. And land-based sequestration methods are an important uh, component of that. And developing countries have huge amounts of land that could be used to do this sensibly, just given, given where they sit in the geography of the earth. Uh, and how they're going to be paid to do that, because let's be realistic, it's not going to happen unless there's some sensible economic reason to do it. And equally, it's it's in many ways, it's the moral and uh, economic, it's, moral, it's our moral obligation, probably our, in, a, in our economic interest to be supporting that sort of action. So, you know, Mark Carney has been working on this with the Task Force for Vo Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets. There's been a set of offsetting principles that Oxford has launched to help try to steer and guide that process. You know, there's a lot going on here that relates to the developing world. As, and it's not just land, obviously, um, that relates to their, their efforts as well as ours. So, you know, um, yeah, there's an awful lot to say, but let me stop there. And you, you provided a beautiful pointer to the issue of negative emissions, carbon sequestration on land, which will be the topic, in fact, of our talk next week with Mikhail Obersteiner, the role of negative emissions, which, of course, is crucially why we have the net in net zero. And if you're interested in that, you can click on the green button, which hopefully you can see below. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're out of time and there are many more questions, of course, very good questions, which we don't get around to discussing, but I'm going to give both Suganda and then Cameron an opportunity just to mop up their final thoughts, address any key ones they were desperate to address in the questions, and then I'll wrap up. So, uh, Suganda, the last word from you, please.
Great. Um, so the last word, I mean, I do want to emphasize that politics is very important in this. Uh, I think that we need to recognize there are certain preconditions. If you think about legal SIPs, you need to ask, are the courts independent? Uh, are they um, able to actually action these petitions? Uh, whether we think about co-opting and changing the behavior of big shipping companies or aviation companies, we need to look at the lobbying dynamics of these big and powerful vested interests groups. Um, how can we make it in their incentive to change their business models? Can we make green recovery tied to innovation? Um, and, you know, how does, you know, Greta Thunberg's kind of antagonistic movement tie into building social consciousness? And how does that in itself change into um, affecting the social license to operate for these big groups? I think in the end, uh, all of these things are very interconnected um, and there's a lot of mutually reinforcing dynamics between different sensitive intervention points. And going forward, um, I think from, you know, we had a voting game, which was really fun, but I think really this is also about how capital flows shape public opinion, how that affects technological progress um, and the interlinkages. So I'll leave it at that um, and just to reemphasize that political feasibility is one of the most important challenges. And uh, I do want to emphasize that we're thinking about that. Cameron, final thoughts from you? Thanks, Steve. Um, look, it's a, it's a great area. It's very fun to be researching this area. Thank you for, to all for you coming along and for your great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to Nicholas's question on energy storage, Peggy's on population. Uh, Daniel's on the speed limit and Harriet's on heat pumps, all great questions. I think the message I want to leave you with is just that we can get this job done. Uh, this lens of thinking about a portfolio of interventions is, I think, an important and useful one. We are continuing to work on it, uh, the post-carbon transition program. We've got a couple of dozen papers in progress, some published. So uh, do keep tabs on us if you're interested. Thanks for joining today. And obviously, um, you should look forward to Michael's talk next week. I'm sure it'll be, be brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for that plug. And uh, th this talk has been recorded and will be available for you to refer back to if you want to look at the slides again or, or go back through the comments on, on YouTube in due course. So it just remains for me to say a huge thank you to Professor Cameron Hepburn and Suganda Stravastav. Um, and wish you all a good week and best wishes in particular to you, Suganda, and everyone in Myanmar um, for, for the weeks and days ahead. Uh, so take care, everybody, and see you next week.